Hey, welcome back. It's good to see you again. And today, we finally finished the preface to the Art of War, and it's time to begin. So this is the first chapter or first book in the Art of War. One, Sun Tzu said, the art of war is of vital importance to the state. 2. It is a matter of life and death, a road either to safety or to ruin. Hence it is a subject of inquiry which can no account be neglected. 3. The art of war then is governed by five constant factors to be taken into account in one's deliberations when seeking to determine the conditions obtaining in the field. 4. There are 1. The moral law, 2. Heaven, 3. Earth, 4. The commander, 5. Method, and discipline. It appears from what follows that Sun Tzu means by moral law a principle of harmony, not unlike the Tao of Lao Tzu in its moral aspect. One might be tempted to render it moral were it not considered an attribute of the ruler in 13. 5 and 6. The moral law causes the people to be in the complete accord with their ruler, so that they will follow him regardless of their lives, undismayed by any danger. To you, quotes Wang Tzu as saying, without constant practice, the officers will be nervous and undecided when mustering for battle. Without constant practice, the general will be wavering and irresolute when the crisis is at hand. 7. Heaven signifies night and day, cold and heat, time and seasons. The commentators, I think, make an unnecessary mystery of two words here. Mengxi refers to the hard and the soft waxing and waning of heaven. Wang Si, however, may be right in saying what is meant is the general economy of heaven, including the five elements, the four seasons, wind and clouds and other phenomena. 8. Earth comprises distances great and small, danger and security, open ground and narrow passes the chances of life and death. 9. The commander stands for the virtues of wisdom, sincerity, benevolence, courage and strictness. The five cardinal virtues of the Chinese are 1. Humanity or benevolence 2. Uprightness of a mind 3. Self-respect, self-control or proper feeling 4. Wisdom 5. Sincerity or good faith Here wisdom and sincerity are put before humanity and benevolence and the two military virtues of courage and strictness, substituted for uprightness of mind, and self-respect, self-control, and proper feeling. 10. By method and discipline are to be understood the marshalling of an army in its proper subdivisions, the graduations of rank, among the officers, the maintenance of roads by which supplies may reach the army 
and the control of military expenditure. 11. These five heads should be familiar to every general. He who knows them will be victorious. He who does not know them will fail. 12. Therefore, in your deliberations, when seeking to determine the military conditions, let them be made the basis of a comparison. In this wise. 13. 1. Which of the two sovereigns is imbued with the moral law, i.e., is in harmony with his subjects? 2. Which of the two generals has the most ability? 3. With whom lie the advantages derived from heaven and earth? 4. On which side is discipline most rigorously enforced? Chu Mu alludes to the remarkable story of Cao and Xiao, who was such a strict disciplinarian that once, in accordance with his own severe regulations against injury to standing crops, he condemned himself for death, for having allowed his horse to shy into a field of corn. However, in lieu of losing his head, he was persuaded to satisfy his sense of justice by cutting off his hair. Cao Cao's own comment on the present passage is characteristically curt. When you lay down a law, see that it is not disobeyed. If it is disobeyed, the offender must be put to death. 5. Which army is stronger, morally as well as physically? As Mei Yao Chen puts it, freely rendered. Esprit de corps and big battalions. Six. On which side are offenders and men more highly trained? To you quotes Wang Tzu as saying, without constant practice, the officers will be nervous and undecided when mustering for battle. Without constant practice, the general will be wavering and irresolute when crisis is at hand. Seven. In which army is there the greater constancy both in reward and in punishment? On which side is there the most absolute certainty that merit will be properly rewarded and misdeeds summarily punished? Back to the full list. 14. By means of these seven considerations, I can forecast victory or defeat. 15. The general that hearkens to my counsel and acts upon it will conquer. Let such a one be retained in command. The general that hearkens not to my counsel nor acts upon it will and suffer defeat. Let such a one be dismissed. The form of this paragraph reminds us that Sun Tzu's treatise was composed expressly for the benefit of his patron Ho Lu, king of the Wu state. 16. While having the profit of my counsel, avail yourself of any helpful circumstances over and beyond the ordinary rules. 17. According as any circumstances are favourable, one should modify one's plans. Sun Tzu, as a practical soldier, will have none of the bookish theory. 
he cautions us here not to pin our faith on abstract principles. For, as Chang Yu puts it, while the main laws of strategy can be stated clearly enough for the benefit of all and sundry, you must be guided by the actions of the enemy in attempting to secure a favourable position in actual warfare. On the eve of the Battle of Waterloo, Lord Oxbridge, commanding the cavalry, went to the Duke of Wellington in order to learn what his plans and calculations were for the morrow, because, as he explained, he might suddenly find himself commander-in-chief and would be unable to frame new plans in a critical moment. The Duke listened quietly and then said, Who will attack the first tomorrow, I or Bonaparte? Bonaparte, replied Lord Oxbridge. Well, continued the Duke, Bonaparte has not given me any idea of his projects, and as my plans will depend upon his, how can you expect me to tell you what mine are? Eighteen. All warfare is based on deception. The truth of this pithy and profound saying will be admitted by every soldier. Colonel Henderson tells us that Wellington, great in so many military qualities, was especially distinguished by the extraordinary skill with which he concealed his movements and deceived both friend and foe. 19. Hence, when able to attack we must seem unable, when using our forces we must seem inactive, when we are near, we must make the enemy believe we are far away. When we are far away, we must make him believe we are near. 20. Hold out baits to entice the enemy, feign disorder, and crush him. All commentators except Chang Yu say, when he is in disorder, crush him. It is more natural to suppose that Sun Tzu is illustrating the uses of deception in war. 21. If he is secure at all points, be prepared for him. If he is superior, strength evade him. 22. If your opponent is of choleric temper, seek to irritate him. Pretend to be weak that he may grow arrogant. Wang Tzu, quoted by Tu Yu, says that the good tactician plays with his adversary as a cat plays with a mouse, first feigning weakness and immobility, and then suddenly pouncing upon him. 23. If he is taking his ease, give him no rest. This is probably the meaning, though Mei Yao Chi has the note. While we are taking our ease, wait for the enemy to tire himself. The Yu Lan has lure him and tire him out. If his forces are united, separate them. Less plausible is the interpretation favoured by the most of his commentators. If sovereign and subject are in accord, put division between them. 24. Attack him where he is unprepared. Appear where you are not expected. 25. These military devices leading to victory must not be divulged beforehand. 26. 
Now the general who wins battle makes many calculations in his temple ere the battle is fought. Chang Yu tells us that in ancient times it was customary for a temple to be set apart for the use of a general who was about to take the field, in order that he might elaborate his plan of campaign. The general who loses a battle makes but few calculations beforehand. Thus do many calculations lead to victory, a few calculations to defeat. How much more no calculation at all? It is by attention to this point that I can foresee who is likely to win or to lose. Thank you for joining me for another episode. I hope you enjoyed it. And I'm glad that you're here with me. I hope that you got to have a rest and a break and a pause and good night.